Um, you could stay seated, actually. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, so let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. It's, I just think it's very interesting to me. Uh, we made it a practice in our church to take a book of the Bible and teach right through it. And so many times when there's some circumstance or some situation taking place in the life of our church or in the life of some individuals in our church, it's amazing how many times that the particular passage on a Sunday morning will line up with exactly what we need for that day. And I think it's far better that way than if it was selected or chosen by the pastor because, you know, he knew that something was going on, so then he purposely preached on a you know, particular subject or whatever like that. I think it has more force and more impact when it's lined up and ordained by God. Just so happen to stumble upon a certain verse that I think is needed. Um, you know, so many times we also think that we know what something means because we think we know what it means. And we really don't. And then when you study something out in the Bible and find out, man, I actually didn't have that right at all. You had to study it through the Bible. Is that AC still turned on? Yeah. Yeah, might as well kick, kick that off. Keep that fan blowing. Though. And uh, when you study the Bible and then you, you know, when you get it right, it's so much better than what you thought it meant or what you thought it was, you know. And God's Word is always superior. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than the, as high as the heaven is from the earth, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And I just want to uh, give a quick few sentence summary of, of my thoughts while I was prepping this message. And then we'll pray and we'll study the Bible and we'll get to the conclusion of the matter. So number one, a, re a reprobate mind. We're going to be talking about reprobate minds this morning. A reprobate mind cannot be determined until all the evidence has been turned in. People they, they, people don't have reprobate minds, but it's a result uh, of, you know, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. It's, it's the outcome. It's the determination. And in the Bible, a rep, repro, reprobation is God examining all the evidence and then coming to the conclusion that there's nothing of value there. If there's no value to be found. And remember our text from last week, we talked about vile affections. Vile affections, that we're, we're, where should our affections be? They should be set on things above. The world, most, of, most people, they set their affections on things on the earth, vile things, unclean things, things that are temporary, base. And uh, I would sure hate to have spent my whole life, Lord willing, preaching God's word and standing before the Lord and having the, having the Lord examine all my life and finding there's nothing of value here. There's nothing that's, worth keeping in that life that he lived, nothing that's worth keeping in that ministry that I gave him. And the Lord, war uh, he warns in Romans chapter 1 about people who, because they reject God, because they don't want to think about God, because they don't want to keep God in their knowledge and don't want to live according to God's word, when all is said and done in their life, he finds that there's nothing of value and there's nothing worth keeping. I don't want my marriage to be reprobate. I don't want my family to be reprobate. I don't want my, uh, our church to be reprobate. And You could be full of activity. You could be as busy as you can be for the Lord, and you can be reprobate. That's what I'm coming to conclude. And uh, When all is said and done, and God examines our whole life, will He determine, is there anything of value in that life that I gave Him? You know, will God determine if there's anything that's worth keeping that will last and, and abide? So this, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. That's where we're going, and we're going to see if the Bible bears this out, and I think, I, I think it will. So the title of the message will be The, uh, the Reprobate Mind. Uh, first, let me just pray real quick. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, I just pray that you bless your word to your hearts this morning. Help us, Lord, to believe it and act upon it and be bettered by it, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So first off, let's, let's look what we have available to us. Romans chapter 1, we've been in chapter 1 for all year. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. I want to show you what we have available to us first. What everybody has available to them first. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm just going to pick out some things. Gospel of Christ, verse 16. Same thing. Uh, it is the power of God unto salvation. Look at verse 17. The righteousness of God. Praise the Lord. The righteousness of God. Verse number uh, uh, 19. 
because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Verse 20, the invisible things from the creation world are clearly seen. Praise the Lord for that. And yet, in response to that, the Bible says in verse number 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's the descent into darkness, the lack of thanksgiving, the lack of giving gratitude towards God. You don't, you don't thank God for the good and bad in your life and what you got going on. You descend into vain imaginations and a darkened heart. Verse number 22, look what happens. They become fools, professing themselves to be wise. They became, as, they became fools. Verse 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image after their own vain imagination. Verse 24, look what it says. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. And verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Verse number 26 and 27, homosexual behavior. In verse number 28, Look at verse 28. Here would be our text for this morning. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then from verses 29 to 32, a bunch of sins. And I think what the Lord's leading me to do is to preach on every one of those sins, one per week. So if you don't like preaching on sin... Go over to the Amplify Church and have a good time over there because we're probably going to be talking about sin for, I don't know, 12 weeks till the end of the year. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll lump two of them together or whatever, but I think, it's, I think it's needful. Now, do you see what happened here? What happened is this. What, what's, what's available to us? Salvation, grace, the power of God, faith, truth, life, glory and then man man says this i don't want that i don't want none of that and okay and god says that's fine what do you want what do you what, what do you want help yourself and when it's all said and done the uh the, the man wants lust uncleanness he wants to do his own things i want i want to do whatever i want to do with no restrictions uh, no restraint and god says all right that's fine go ahead help yourself he'll give you over to your own desires. And when that's all said and done, the Lord evaluates the, the, the lives of those that did not want to live for God and not want to partake in God's blessings. And he says, there's nothing here. There's nothing here that's worth of value. It's, all, it's, it's nothing here that's worth keeping. And I would say to you increasingly that that sums up the, the state of our, of our society in which you live. It's, it's going down that road. And we're, we're carrying people to the cemeteries at various ages, uh, you know, and people get up, the minister stands up, the family members stand up, and they try to think about, they give a five-minute speech on to try to tell you why this so-and-so's life was of some value. How they, how, you know, how did they value uh, society, and how did they, you know, uh, w w why was their life, worth living you know and people give they stand up and give all kinds of speeches about that and you know uh but i think this is how, how was the spiritual condition of that person how was the spiritual condition did did that person live a li live their life trying to be any godly example did they did they get anybody in their life to try to worship and live for god while they while they lived on, on this earth and it's sad to say but for most people most people they have a birth date then they have the date of death. And for most people, the only thing that, that they do in between all that is just a little hyphen, a little dash mark. You see that. Date of birth, dash, date of death. That's it. It's just, it's, just a, it's just a little dash. And it's not that all these people were terribly wicked and horrible and, you know, just you know, the scum of the earth type of people. No, but it's just the sum of 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years of their life ended up amounting to nothing, just a dash. And in, in, this, in this life, now what about the life to come? What about the life to come? And I die today, I step out into eternity. You die today, you step out into eternity, and you stand before God. 
Do you think God cares about how many cars you have? Do you think God cares about the square footage of your house? Do you think God cares about how much money you got in the bank? Do you think God cares about how many pairs of shoes you got in the wardrobe or anything? No, he don't care about that. And I'm not saying any of those things are sinful in and of themselves, but you know, you may say, well, I thought this passage was about, was about vile people and reprobate minds. No, these people, you know, were, they were doing vile acts and were given over to reprobate minds. Give, doing vile acts, given over to reprobate minds. That's how, that's how it goes. And uh, they're, not, they're not reprobates first, and then they do these things. Okay, they're not, they spent their whole lives doing things that didn't please God, their whole lives. And the end, the end result was reprobation. That's the end result. Do you really want to stand before God in having won nobody to Jesus Christ your entire Christian life? Do you want to stand before God and there's not one member in our church that isn't there because you brought them there? Do you want to stand before God and, you know, not having one person your entire life looked up to you as a godly example, you want to stand before God and, and, and have that type of judgment going down at the judgment seat of Christ, there comes a day when the Lord is going to add it all up. Every one of us shall give an account of ourselves before God. He's going to add it all up. And uh, you don't want to be found reprobate. I don't want to be found reprobate. I don't want to look back and say, well, I had some fun. I had some good times. I went to see some nice places. I sat down. I ate a lot of good food. And, but what, what did you accomplish for God? What did you accomplish for others? What did you leave behind that is of any eternal value? What did you leave behind at all? So if, if the sum total of your whole life was just a house full of things and full of clothes, in toys and gadgets and cars and boats and, and that people are all going to fight about whenever you're gone and whoever tries to inherit all that stuff. If, that, if that's all that your life consisted of, that's a, you just took up a lot of space in your whole life. That's, that's all you did. So let's look at Jeremiah. Let's see what the Bible says about reprobation. Jeremiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament. In... Just watch how the Bible def defines the term for us, all right? Matching that of uh, Mr. Webster's definition. Well, actually, Webster's definition matches what the Bible says, but I do like Noah Webster's dictionary definition because he always goes back to what the Bible says. So look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 6, and while you're finding it, that's page 997, 997 in the, uh, in the Bible in the pew. Here's his dictionary definition, all right? Reprobate. It means not enduring proof or trial, not of standard purity or fineness, as a result, disallowed and rejected. That's something, all right? And here, here's kind of, here's our thinking, or here, here was my, my thinking. You know, God makes, someone, God makes someone a reprobate, and then they go out and do terrible things. You know, no, it's not, it's not like that. The Bible says people didn't want God, and then they went out and did things of their own, and the end result was reprobation, okay? So look at Jeremiah chapter 6, look at verse number 28. Jeremiah 6, 28. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are, they are all corruptors. The bellows are burned. Uh, the bellows, it's the thing that fuels the flames. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth it in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Look at verse 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. The Lord rejected them. So let me try giving you an illustration on this. So let's say, you know, we think that somewhere up in, a mountain in Alaska that there's a, this mountain has silver in it. So a comp we hire a company and it comes in and it begins to mine in Alaska where, where we think that the silver is. And then it takes it, it hauls out the ore that they find in the mountain. They go take it back to the factory and the, the factory got this big smelting furnace. 
super hot furnace and they throw all these rocks into the furnace. And this thing is so hot that it melts away all the worthless rock and whatever ends up coming out at the end of that conveyor belt is, is, the, is pure silver. All right, that's the whole, that's the process. If there, if there even is any real silver in it, it will abide through the fire and it will come out. All the other stuff will be melted away. If, if we put that rock into the furnace, it doesn't matter if the top geologist said there is silver in that mountain. If, if we put that, it doesn't matter that even if we believe that there's silver in this mountain. It don't even matter if we found a treasure map that told us there's silver in that mountain over there. If, if that rock doesn't go through that fire and come out and, and there's, there's no silver in it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, what we found, what we thought, anything, what we believe. The only way to know for sure is you have to burn everything else. Burn it all, and if there's any real silver, it will abide the fire. So here's the point. If there's no abiding silver after the process of melting it through the, that, putting that ore through the fire, we declare it as reprobate. It's reprobate. It's, uh, it's nothing, there's, there's of no value here. There's of no substance. It's, all right, we thought it was in this mountain. It's not on to the next mountain now. And you know something? It, it does not matter what you vowed to do when you were 18 years old. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, the, it doesn't matter the vows that I've stood before my wife and I made vows to my wife. That, 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 that don't matter. It doesn't matter what you promised your company when you got hired and said, I'm going to offer you this, I'm going to do this and do that, and here's my skills. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the vows that you make to the Lord when you were at some great revival meeting and you heard some really convicting message and you vowed to the Lord, I'm going to change my life now and get things all fixed up. It doesn't matter. One day, God is going to take the sum total of your entire life and it's going to, He's going to burn away everything that was vanity, everything that was meaningless, everything that was sinful, everything that was carnal that we've done in the flesh. And here's the question, will there be anything left? Is there going to be anything left? Will, there, will anything remain? Will anything abide through that fire? Or will I be declared as reprobate? Don't matter. You said all this stuff. You did all this stuff. Said it all. Here's the end result. Here's the end trial. Come out. It was nothing there. Reprobate. It's easy to say. It's very easy to say. I'm a Bible. I'm a Bible believing Christian. And look, that, that, all that, look at them. God forsaken homosexuals. That's what Romans chapter one is all about. I'm not like them. They're reprobates. Well, how, how about this? How about this? What if I don't do what they do, but I don't do anything for God? <laughs> well, what, what would I be? What, what, what if I never, I never kiss a man in my life, but I never love my neighbor like myself? What, what if I, I never have a boyfriend, but what if I never treated my wife with respect and honor and love and kindness? At the end, at the end of their life, they're reprobates, you know, be, because there's nothing of value to God in their life. And I'm reprobate because there's nothing of value to God in the life that I lived if I did all those things. And reprobation is not the committing of certain sins that you don't think you would ever commit. It's uh, reprobation is just living and taking up space. And it's just breathing air, eating food, and then just dying like there wasn't even a God in heaven. I don't want to be reprobate. I don't. Amen. And, and thank you because I, I'm, you know, I hope I'm not just preaching to myself up here. I hope I'm trying to reach somebody too. I don't want the Lord to examine my life and say, those five years, he did nothing. Those next five years of his life, nothing. Next five years of his life, nothing. Next five years, he did nothing. I, th I picture the, the father looking over to the son and saying, you got, you got a record of anything that, that he did for me? And the son's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't really find anything on him. I don't, we, don't got no, we don't got no record. You know, did, is there anything that he ever did for us and did for others for the sake of wanting to, to please us at all? And I don't, I don't know. We can't, can't find anything. I don't want to live and die that way. Before when I stand before God. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look in the New Testament now. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know what? And I was looking up these references of, of reprobation and reprobate. 
And it's interesting that a good portion of the New Testament references to reprobate are in the pastoral epistles. Timothy, Titus. So you know what that tells me? That means it's talking to dads, moms, granddads, grandmas. Talks about aged women, things like that. Employers, masters, servants, employees, church leaders. So I'm thinking there's, 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 there's something here. In this. Look at look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 7. 2 Timothy 3, 7. And this is in the context of this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. That's what the Bible says it's going to be in the last days. Perilous times. And we go read through the list. We get down to verse 7. Here's what it says. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now... As he gives two guys here, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, look what it says, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Now go back to verse number six. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Now watch us. So Janus, he's a teacher. He's a teacher of black magic. He's a te he's a, these are the, the, as you know, tradition would always say, these are the two magicians that withstood Moses. As Moses is doing the miracles of God, Janus and Jambres were there copying the miracles and doing things. Janus was a teacher. Of, of sorcery, teacher of black magic. Moses was a teacher. He was a teacher. Jambres, same thing. He Jambres was a teacher. Moses was a teacher. So I think about this. If you took both of their courses at a university, you might leave their class and think, both of those guys were great teachers. <laughs> and you might leave their class and say, they were very intelligent people. You might leave their class and say, man, they were very interesting speakers. You might leave the class and say, man, I learned a lot out of that class. And uh, the people who listened to Moses when he, when he taught the people during the times of getting his people out of Egypt, the, the, the people who listened to Moses, they had a right relationship with God. They were searching for God. They had a right family life, right you know, uh, home life, right family, received God's saving truths. Then the people that listened to Janus and Jambres, they died in trespasses and sins. They, they, they were longing for the idols of Egypt instead of listening to, to Moses. So the question is, when do we determine when Janus and Jambres are reprobate? Not, not when they're teaching, but when we see the fruit of their teaching in the lives of those that followed them. We see that's, that's, in a way, how you can tell. So in the New Testament church, I think of it like this. Well, people say, he's a great speaker. He's a, he's a gifted minister. He's a, or she, she's a wonderful, she's a wonderful singer. Or he's an he's a energetic soul winner. If the end, end result of their ministry is people dropping out of church, is, is getting people, you know, turning away from the truths of the Bible, then they're reprobates. No matter how great you thought of a Christian leader that they were. And if the end result of their ministry is people living for the Lord, trying to obey Jesus Christ, then they're commended by God. And that's, that's what you just read. It didn't, it didn't say Janus was a bad teacher, it, but the result of his teaching was that pe people were, were, he led away, you know, silly women laden with sins. And it didn't say Jambres was boring or not gifted, but the result of his teaching was that people were creeping into houses and uh, serving diverse lusts. This, that's what the whole picture here is, is, is like there. And uh, if you read your Bible, which I would highly recommend you do, read your Bible, you look up in Acts chapter 2, when, pe when people got saved, they were added to the church. You look at in, in what happened in Acts chapter 3, people got saved, they were added to the church. You read the book of Thessalonians, people got saved, they, they started the church. Philippi, same thing, started the church, that's what happened. In uh, Ephesians and Timothy and Titus and, and Hebrews, it says that God gave saved people, pastors and deacons and elders that 
all part of the body of Christ. And the fact that there's a thousand teachers out there on, you know, people say, I found all these great teachers, you know, online. Or if, these, if these great teachers online, if they compel you to drop out of church or forsake core doctrines of, of Christianity, they may be great teachers, but they're reprobate because they're not producing biblical Christianity. You know, they're producing something that runs contrary to that. So there are, in your community, in our communities, communities all across the America, uh, there are pastors out there that are far more dynamic than I am. There's pastors out there that are far more better looking than I am. There's pastors out there, who pastors' wives, they, they get up on stage, they put on a big show, they could, you know, they, they, they could dance way, not... Well, good thing my wife's on here. Not way better than my wife, but my wife wouldn't do such a thing. <laughs> but they get up on stage, or you know, wives entertain, you know, the, the whole congregation and stuff like that. And you, and you may say, well, look how, um, look how amazing, look how fast their church is growing. Look at, look at the, the size of their congregation. Yeah, but if you examine the content of their congregation, it's filled with people that are living in adultery, filled with people that are living in fornication, living, living in their sin, in... In, in thinking that God is okay with living in their sin and things like that. So reprobation, it's, it's not revealed in the ability of the speaker to wow, wow a crowd or something like that and build a huge congregation. The, the end result, of uh, the, the, what, the evidence of reprobation is what was the end result? That's, that's where, where, it's, where I'm going with this. And th does it line up with God's word? And I don't want to think I'm spending my entire life Lord willing, preaching God's word to people and people aren't getting saved and people aren't joining a church and people aren't cleaning up their lives if all I got is just an audience. And that's no indication of God's blessing if all I got is just an audience. That, that's, that certainly doesn't, and it certainly doesn't mean that there's no reprobation. So come on. Now, when the, when the trials, when the troubles in your life, all right, let's say the, the fire of home difficulty or the, the fires of financial difficulty or the, the fires of having friction and tension between brothers and sisters in Christ. When the, when the fire comes, that's when we'll find out whether you really believe anything or not. And you, you, you can say you believe the Bible, you know, about the certain things that it says about the home, but do you believe the Bible when you actually need those things? about a certain situation going on in your home? Do, do you actually need the Bible or you just believe it, you know? You can say you, be, you believe the Bible of, I believe what the Bible says about walking with the Lord. Okay, what happens when you, you, when you need to walk with the Lord? Do you, do you actually use those verses? What, what, do they, you put them into practice? Do they mean anything? It's the fires, the trials, the troubles, tribulations, persecutions. That's what really manifests whether or not, you know, you're, it's true silver that's going to come out or whether or not it was just a bunch of rocks, big pile of rock. And obviously, you know how it goes. Most likely when it comes out, it's just a whole lot of rocks. A whole lot of ro rocks go in and just, okay, maybe a little bit of silver comes out of that thing. I don't want to be reprobate. I don't, wanna, I don't want the trials of my life to prove that I got up here and just talked to talk, but I didn't walk to walk. I don't want that. I don't, I don't want the hardships that are going to happen in my life, difficulties that are going to happen in my life, to prove that there was nothing to what I said. I don't want that. I want to stand before the Lord and watch everything that I thought that I did for the Lord just go up and smoke and find nothing. Nothing that I did was pleasing to God. That's what the verse says. Look at Titus. I'll show you it again. Look at Titus. Now here, look at Titus. In the next book to the right. If you're in Timothy, go over to Titus. Now here he talks in verse number 5 about elders. Verse 7 talks about bishops. Look at Titus chapter 1. Look at verse number 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So it's one thing to have sound doctrine and get all your doctrinal, you know, T's crossed and I's dotted, get all your doctrine right. But do you have sound doctrine to the extent that you can actually convince somebody that doesn't have sound doctrine? 
to then, you know, exhort them to have sound doctrine? Is, is, there, is there any type of effect that they could be won over to sound doctrine? That's what he says. That to both exhort and to convince, not the Christians, but the gainsayers. Look at verse number 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. That's true, right? Unruly, vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So, uh, Paul actually zeroes in on, on the Jewish people here, actually. Uh, verse number, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the Gentiles, the circumcision, Gentile people. Look at verse 11. Whose mouths must be stopped. Okay, why? Who subvert whole houses, teaching things for what they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Anybody ever hear that word? You know, you're like a Cretan, a Cretan. Well, that's, that's where the, the phrase is from, from the Bible. It was a certain group of people. They were liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of, uh, of men who, uh, that turn from the truth. Then look at this verse. I like this verse. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now look at verse 16. They profess. Now watch this. They profess that they know God. Do you know people like that? <laughs> they profess they, they know God. Oh yeah, I, I know God. You know, so look, their words are right. I know God. That's okay, that's the, the right words. My statement of faith, my, my doctrinal stand is orthodox. I believe the fundamentals of the faith. You know, they may even go to church. Look at this. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Being what? Abominable. <laughs> that's just like a homosexual. You're an abomination if you, den if, if you don't do anything else for God. De they, deny, uh, they deny him in works, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work, reprobate. That's what it says. That matches every other passage that we read so far about reprobation. So I might say this. Wh wh what do you believe about Jesus Christ if I asked you that? Most people would say, Christ, you know, uh, people that know God and things, I believe he's God manifest in the flesh. All right? Uh, you know, okay. What, what place do you think Jesus Christ should have in the life of the individual? Well, you know, I, I think he should be the most important thing in your entire life. Okay, good. I'll see you at Bible study this week. Oh, I can't, I, I, you know, I can't be there. I got, you know, whatever going on or whatever. Okay, all right, that's, that's understandable. All right, you know, we'll see you on, we'll see you on Sunday morning then. No, nah, I, I can't. I ain't going to be able to make it. Can't do that. Got better things going on and stuff like that. Well, okay, well, I assume you're reading your Bible. I assume you're praying. Ah, I don't got time for that either. I don't, you know, I'll lift, throw up a prayer every so often, read the Bible, maybe a verse or two, maybe once a week. So your profession doesn't match your conduct. That's what it, that's what it says. You, ha you have the correct profession. I believe the Bible, believe Jesus, believe come church. You have the pr correct uh, profession, but when you try that profession, it's found reprobate. That's, that's what it says. And, you know, when people say, oh, you know, there's, not, there's nothing, more, nothing more important in life than leading, leading souls to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's 100%. Amen. Well, when's the last time you gave a tract out? Last time you even just spoke up for Jesus at all in your life. However long you've been a Christian, when's the last time? And you, you walk out here and say, yeah, it's great. You know, God, you know, God talk about the Lord. God do something for him. Anybody can make the right profession. That's easy. But if there, but if there isn't any resulting conduct, then we're, we're reprobates. We're reprobates. You know, when we don't put what we believe you know, to the test, actually, and don't, don't apply it, then, then we don't believe it. It's, it's, it's easy to, it's very easy to say, I believe the Bible is true. And, um, but if I'm not allowing the Bible to govern my life, I'm just talking. I don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe what it's saying. And there, you know, there are people from time to time that, you know, want to come to church, a, a Bible-believing church, whatever, and they want to be intellectually challenged. They want to be stimulated and, and want to actually learn some things from the Bible and, they don't want to be bored when they come to church. They, a lot of churches out there, they're, you know, they're like, they just got 
They just got the meringue, but they don't got no pie. There's no substance to it. Just a whole bunch of fluff and a bunch of just things on the top, but there's no substance. You know, you want you want the substance really. And people people want to you know want to learn the Bible. And but look, if you come here in any Bible believing church and you sit down and you learn the Bible and and you learn everything about what the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation about you know tipping the bottle or whatever. You learn about it all, you know, what, you know what the Bible says about it, and then you run out here, and then you get drunk. Well, what happened? You're, you're reprobate. So re reprobation is not being wrong as to the facts. You know the facts. You, you, you know all this. But reprobate, reprobation is, is not putting those facts that you know into practical application. That's what it is. Now here's what we say. We say, well, bless God, I, I wouldn't do anything like that. I wouldn't do that. And, you know, we read Romans 1 and we say, you know, well, well, that man, they heard the word of God and he, he didn't like it. He didn't want to be governed by it. Now look at him. Now he's a homosexual. And, okay, well, how about the man that heard the word of God, that saw the word of God and never did anything with the word of God? What, what's he? You know, what, what about the man that heard the word of God, saw what it said and didn't love his neighbor as himself? Or the man that, that saw the word of God knew what it knew, you know, knew what it said, and still wasn't faithful to read his Bible or pray, come to church or whatever. What, why are the homosexuals reprobates, and you're not? You, you, you see what I'm getting at? And then you know, you may say, well, they don't they don't even know their Bible. You know, they they don't even know what the Bible teaches. Every homosexual in town knows what the Bible teaches on homosexuality. <laughs> I'll make a general blanket statement. Most of them know. Hey, I'm a Christian, you know, uh, you're, you're, if you're a homosexual, do you know what the Bible says about homosexuality? Most of them will say, yeah, I know exactly what it teaches, and I don't, I don't want it. Get out of here. You know, keep on, keep on moving. They, they know. You know and, and, every, and every one of us knows what the Bible teaches on the certain sins that we do. <laughs> right? We know what the Bible teaches on those things, and yet we, that's what we're doing. So what I'm saying is this. I, I don't want to spend my life preaching something that I don't believe enough to actually put into practice. And you don't want to spend your life just sitting there. For a couple of years now I've been preaching up here, just sitting there listening and nodding your head and saying, yeah, that's right, yeah, amen, you know, that's right, it all sounds good, and then going out here and not practicing it. <laughs> I don't want that for my life. You don't want that for your life. Because in this life and the life to come, God's going to put the whole thing in the fire, and it's not going to, it's not going to matter how much rock we haul around our whole life. Look at me, I got all this rock. You know, look at all this, this big thing. Wow, it looks like a lot. You get the rock out the way, there's only just a little handful of, of silver sitting there. You know, is there anything of value that's in our life? So, you know, maybe, every, maybe everybody thought you were some great Christian. Well, if you weren't, it doesn't matter when it, what everybody thought. God's going to find that thing out. He'll find it out. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 13 now. Here's another one. Hebrews chapter 13. My wife doesn't want to be married to somebody who can quote verses about husbands love your wives. She don't want to be married to somebody that just could, could quote, quote the verse. She wants to be married to somebody that <laughs> loves her, Right? That's what the, uh, you know, yeah, I know what Ephesians 5 says, and I know what, you know, what this says. Well, if, you, if you're not loving your wife, not treat, taking care of your wife, not treating your wife with appreciation and, and loving her for all she puts up with, you know, for you, you don't believe the Bible. And don't try to convince me and tell me that you do. <laughs> That's, you don't. So, you know, your children. Your children don't want, want parents who can quote what the Bible says about how much, you know, we love Jesus, we love Jesus. I could quote, quote you all the verses on it. Your children want to see, do you, do you really love Jesus? Do you really love Jesus? And a town, a little town, it, do, it doesn't need a, a whole church you know, full of people that believe in the King James Bible. They need a church, a, a town that's filled with people that practice the King James Bible. That's, that's, that, it, so, that's, so in Hebrews 13, if you're looking for leadership in your home, leadership in the church, I like this instruction here. Look at Hebrews 13, verse number 7. Look what this says. Remember them which have the role over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, 
Does, does, he, does he stop there? No, he actually he doesn't stop there. Look at this. Whose faith follow, considering, look at this, considering the end of their conversation. Consider the end of their conversation. So you know what the Lord says? Number one, you shouldn't be listening to somebody that doesn't tell you the truth. Don't listen to somebody, that a pastor or whatever. If he's not telling you the truth from the Word of God, don't listen to him. But it also says, if you're telling the truth in the Bible, but it has no effect on my life, it has no effect on their life, whoever's teaching you the Bible, don't listen to them either. <laughs> doesn't matter how much they know. If it doesn't affect their life, my life, you have no business at all listening to me or to anybody else. It, that's how it goes. And uh, what, the, what the Lord wants is he wants our doctrine to be correct. And I stress that. We've got we to yeah, we have serious, sound doctrine. We've got to be very specific on what we believe, why we believe it. We ought to be able to prove it from the Scripture and stuff like that. But he also wants our life to be correct. That's what he wants. And, you know, at the, at the judgment seat, of, imagine getting to the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord says, all right, give me the past five verse memorizations that we did on Thursday night. How many verses can you memorize? <laughs> Here's a test. There's a Bible test, you know. How many, how many animals did Noah bring on the ark? Is he, God's not going to do that. He's going to say, what did you do with the verses that you learned? How did you apply them to your life? That's, that's, the, that's the test. <laughs> it's not about your knowledge and your, and your spewing out the facts and things like that. And you say, well, maybe I, I don't know about that. I don't know. Well, let's look a couple more. We're almost done. A couple more. Second Corinthians, all right? 2 Corinthians 13. And this is an interesting reference. All right, the Apostle Paul uses 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse number 1. Page 1543, 2 Corinthians 13. I want you to see this. Another time this word's used. 2 Corinthians 13, 1. Paul says this. He said, this is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Look what he says in verse 3. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, you see that? He wrote a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit of God that was the word of God. And these Corinthians said, all right, we'll, we'll decide whether or not this guy is filled with the Holy Spirit of God when he comes here. We'll, we'll, we'll check him out. We'll, we know, we'll, 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 we'll listen to what he writes when he comes to town and we see how this guy lives. Then we'll, then we'll listen. Now look, shouldn't they just listen because it's the Word of God? Well, yeah. But, but, but who's going to? Who's, who's really going to listen? It's, yeah, who could, rightly, who could rightly be expected to listen to a man holding a marriage seminar and he can't even keep his marriage together. Who, are you going to go to somebody and, and listen to some financial expert, go to some finance seminar, and the guy went bankrupt three times and he's, he's dead broke. And he's going to try getting up there and telling you, eh, how, here's how to make money, and dude's broke. You ain't going to, you ain't going to listen to that. So don't just, don't just tell me what you know. Show me that it works. Show me that it's, it's real. This is, this is real. And look what, Christ, or look what Paul said. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. And you got, that's, that's kind of a valid question. Who's the Apostle Paul? Who are you? You mean tell me God Almighty, Christ is speaking through you? Some guy that doesn't, he wasn't married, he's in jail. Have to, you know, sometimes he, he you know, maybe got one pair of clothes. Why are we going to listen to this guy? When we're the Corinthians, man, you know, we're, we look good. We, we, we boast ourselves of being intellectual and sharp and critical thinkers and you're coming around telling me you're you know you're speaking in the place of, of Christ you're speaking scripture look, look 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 at this since you speak of proof of Christ speaking in me which to you word is not weak but is mighty in you so they're listening to him for the most part for though he was crucified through weakness yet he liveth by the power of God for we also are weak in him but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you here's the here's the verse verse 5 examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith prove to your pastor <laughs> prove to your mom and dad prove to your no look what he says prove your own selves 
Examine yourselves, prove your own selves. No, and then he says, look, know ye not, know ye not your own selves? They say, know, know thyself. This is how you know yourself. Is Jesus Christ truly inside of you? Look, know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? You see what he said? So don't, don't, just go, don't just go home and take the quiz and see how much Bible that you know. Examine your life. Examine, if, is, there, is there anything that's in my life that's of eternal value? Or did I just go and live my life after vile affections? Is there, you know, why, why, would you think that, uh, why would you think that Christ is controlling you? Why do you think that Christ is inside of you? Come and think about that for a little while. That's what he said. Look at verse number six. He says, but I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. <laughs> you know, didn't Paul just write them a letter that was the word of God in 1 Corinthians? Yeah, he did. We're in 2 Corinthians, okay? He wrote them a letter about the resurrection. He wrote them about the glorified bodies we're going to get. He wrote about the, the, the rapture, the, the gospel of salvation. He wrote about the judgment seat of Christ. He wrote all this stuff, the Apostle Paul. His words that he penned down through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, those words are going to be forever settled in heaven. All eternity we'll be sitting around reading 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. That's a, I talk about an eternal weight. And yet Paul, he said, I hope, I hope when we get there that you'll see we're not reprobates. The guy wrote half the New Testament. That should be enough, man. You're, yeah, he clearly. But he's still saying, when we get there, you see how I live? You're going to know for 100% sure we are not reprobates. Then he says, now, verse 7, I, I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Even if you think we're reprobates, that's no excuse for you to be one, period. You think so-and-so, the person next to me is a reprobate, so-and-so is a reprobate, preachers are reprobate, I'm going to be a reprobate. No. <laughs> and matter of fact, I'm not, and hopefully, Lord willing, the people that are around you, they're not. And even if they were, though we be as reprobates, don't be a reprobate. But then he says, For though we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. So everyone in these, these passages that we looked at so far, here's the deal. Somebody says, this rock, this, this rock next to us or whatever, it's full of silver. And somebody says, okay, we'll, we'll find out if it's full of silver. Let's, let's put it through the fire. I'm a great Christian. Okay, well, you know, put it, put it through the fire. Let's see how, how you turn out five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later, you know. And let, let's see if anything shows up and indicates you are what you say you are. Some great Christian or somebody says you are. Now, that's, that's fair. Now, you know, if you tell your parents, I'm honest. I tell the truth. I'm an honest, I'm an honest kid. It, it, it's not what you say, but it's what you do over time. That's what, that's what it all comes down to. If you tell your employer, and, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a good, hard-working employee, I'm honest, well, there, there's a way to find out whether what he said is true or not. you got to test it out. you got to try him out for a uh, course of a couple years and stuff. It'll pour itself out over time. And you say, well, Jesus Christ is, you know, the, is the best life there is. There's nothing worth better than living for Jesus Christ. And there's nothing better than the Bible. Well, we'll find out. If, if you really mean that, we'll find out. We'll see where you are in five years. We'll see where you are in ten years. And that's what he said. You have, do you have a, if you have a hard time, do you just drop out? If you have difficulties and uh, disappointments, do you just drop out? If you lose a loved one that, that was really stimulating you to serve God and they pass away, do you just drop out or do you go on and continue to go on? That's the test. And uh, anybody can say they love the Lord, but... Can you love them in the fire? And the fire will prove the test every time. And it ain't, it's not easy to preach. It's not easy. Look at last, our last stop for this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You probably all know where we're ending. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You've got to make your way there. So some of you are standing on the hilltop of 50 years old, some of you stand on the hilltop of 60, 
70, 80. And no offense, but, you know, there's a lot more road back there than there is ahead of you. And, you know, a lot of the road looking ahead, it doesn't look too pleasant. All right? That's just doesn't look too favorable. But you've got to ask yourself, okay, all those years that, that have gone by, are they just all going to just go up and smoke when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ? What's going to happen? Now look, Eric, now us. If you're standing at the hilltop of 20 years old, 25 years old, 30 years old, it, you know, uh, we think we got this whole, whole road in front of us. Well, what are we going to do? We're just going to just cruise on by and casually just, just get through? Or, or are we going to try doing something for God in this life as we're, you know, come, because it's going to come quicker than we know. We all hear about it. You know, people, I'm sure you guys could tell us, man, I remember when I was a teenager. I remember what I was doing. I was this. And that's going to that's gonna be us one of these days. Uh, you know, I've heard, it, I've heard it growing up, man. You grow up so fast. And by the time now, look, I'm 60 years old. I'm about to be 70 years old, whatever. <laughs> you know, it goes by so fast is what I've always heard. And guess what? That old saying is still true. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's it. That's it. And I like this other poem I looked up. It says, The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. To lose one's wealth is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more. To lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore. The present only is our own. So live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in tomorrow, for the clock may be still. Time's going to go by fast. And, and where's that soul going to be? Where's that soul going to be of yours? And there, there, time's going to go by, and it's, you know, how, how is it going to be when you stand before Jesus Christ, our Savior, who we've been talking about and who you guys have been hearing about for years and years? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse number 1. We'll read this passage, and that's going to be it. 1 Corinthians 3, 1, the Apostle Paul says this, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye were carnal, or for you are yet carnal. For whereas among you there is envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? They, were not, they weren't carnal because they were a bunch of homosexuals, they were carnal because they couldn't get along with each other. <laughs> Bickering and fighting and arguing. That, that's, that's carnality. You know, I, I, I wonder if I'm talking to anyone. You know, you can't just pick the one sin that you think you never commit. And that's, that's the big one, right? Well, how about the sins that we do commit? What, what, what about those ones? Look at verse 4. For while one saith, I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? You know, if you glory in men, you're carnal. If you glory in yourself, you're carnal. Look at verse 5. But who then, who then is Paul? I like that question. I really do. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave every man. You know, you know what else Paul says? He's, he's nothing. Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm not a chief wit behind the apostles, though we be as nothing, you know, people say, I'm doing, I'm doing, you know, great things for God. Look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really compared to the apostle Paul who said he was nothing. Who are you? <laughs> who am I? How, how, how am I doing? How are you doing? I think about that. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? Look at verse number six. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything. So what's that mean? If you're not anything, you're nothing. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. All right, so look, I plant, I water, I build, I farm, I cultivate. And you all do the same. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But 
Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Are you paying attention? What are you building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ? Take heed. Pay, pay attention. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. All right? Now, here, here's the, the end of it, the application of the entire message pretty much. Look at verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Do you see that? Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. A particular day, your work's going to be made manifest. It's going to be revealed. Because, look what it says, it shall be revealed by what? By fire. People, you mean to tell me there's fire up in heaven? You better believe it. <laughs> there's fire in heaven. There's, there's, there's wind, there's fire, there's, there's water. Fire is in heaven. And the fire, look what it does, shall try every man's work of what sort it is. The, 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 the quality of your work. Not the quantity, but the quality. Now look what it says, verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon. Built upon what? Upon Jesus Christ. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, upon Jesus Christ. Look what it says. He shall receive a reward. Salvation is not a reward, it's a free gift. But what you do for Jesus Christ after salvation, here you go. Here's a reward for what you did for me. That's a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Yeah, there's going to be some suffering. You mean to tell me there's suffering up in heaven? Yeah, that's what it says. He shall suffer loss. Look, but, I'll give you, here's something to rejoice about and be happy about. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The fire never touches you. This isn't a Catholic proof text for purgatory. The fire never touches you. The fire tries your work. You say, well, how does that work out? You know, I mean, you know, I don't know how that works out. All I know is God, you know, he, he knows your motives. He knows your thoughts. And, uh, you know, one day I look at it like this. Uh, here it is, you know, the, all, all the way through the Bible. This is, this is pretty much the end of it. Reprobate works the same way. We bring all the ore out of the mountain. All right, and we're going to put it through the smelter in the judgment seat of Christ. And if there's any silver that shows up on the other side of this fire, okay, here you are. Take it. It's, it's yours. You earned it. It's a reward. It, that, this, is the, that, this situation here is the proof of I'm a great Christian. That's the proof. The, the proof that you're dedicated to Christ is not right now. It's not. You could, you could be such a, such a fake and you hear stories and stuff like that about, man, I thought so-and-so was good and what in the world, what's he doing? What happened? Like, it's that, this is not the test of you being a devoted, dedicated Christian. It's at the end. And you know, you know how hard that is to constantly remind ourselves about that and think about that? You know, when your life is over, God's going to take everything you've done. And, I, okay, he'll put it on a conveyor belt. You know, all right, take off your belt, put it on, take off your, put your phone on there, put your, put your shirts on, put your clothes on. Put everything you thought, everything you said, everything you did. Here's the conveyor belt, and you're standing there, probably naked before God. And here's your whole life, going through this, this fire, this trying fire, this purifying fire. And what comes out at the end? You know, I, I mean, I, you know what? I, I had a dream about this the other night. From, you know what came out at the other end of that conveyor belt? A shoe. <laughs> I don't know what the Lord was trying to tell me, I've, and I woke up kind of scared on it. I'm thinking, what? What is this? A shoe come out. You know what I'm saying? And everything was all white, and there's this fire, and that was the illustration, a, con a conveyor belt. And a shoe came out. i got to study that maybe. Maybe there's something the Lord trying to tell me. I, I don't know. I was, you know, I'm going to, huh? Feet first? I don't know. Take off that shoes for the ground which they stand is holy ground, like he said to me. I don't know what that was. I was kind of scared. A shoe came out. And anyway... Anything that you did, anything that you even did that was right, but you did it for your own glory, anything that I did that was correct, but I did it carnally, it was burned up. It's burned up. Not just my sins, not just my, my failures, but, you know, the things that you thought you did in your life that was so spiritual. Look at me now. I'm doing all these things. I'm so spiritual. Ah, you just did that to show off. 
you just did that to show people, look at me, look how great of a Christian I am, pat me on the back. You, nope, nothing. Imagine that, you know. You, 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 just, you, know, you just did that just to compete with so-and-so, you know. I got five souls saved today to the Lord. Man, bless God, I got six saved to the Lord. You know, and then it gets a little competition and stuff. Don't, don't, don't worry, burns up, gone. <laughs> you know, it's all gone. I think about that. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. We all, we all know people who thought that they were going to live a long life and, you know, and they're not around anymore. And I don't want to stand there before God 28 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, and, and have my life come through the belt. And when that thing rolls out, you know, there's nothing there. He gives me a tennis shoe. I, that, you know, what, what is that? It's ab absolute, absolutely nothing. Because what? I live my whole life just for me. I live my whole life for fun. I live my whole life for things and junk. You know what I would be if that was the case, if that happened to me at the judgment seat of Christ? You know what I'd be? I wouldn't be a homosexual. <laughs> I'd be a reprobate. That's what, that's what, that's what would happen. So don't, don't take something out of the Bible and try to apply it to someone or a group of people because you don't like them. And, and take the Bible, what is written, and put it on yourself. Always. I, I, you know, I want to take the Bible like it's written, put it on me. When I stand before God, do you think I'm going to answer for people that are marching down at the pride parades? <laughs> Do you think I'm even going to answer for people that are aborting babies? No, I'm not going to answer for those people. I'm going to answer for myself. That's it. You know, I'm going to answer for what I did with the, with the time that God gave me, with the talents that God gave me, with the opportunities that God gave me, with the strength that God gave me to do these things. You all, you all understand that. And I don't want my entire life to go up into smoke. And I, don't, I, I do not think that you would want that either. I hope you wouldn't. So let's see to it that we're not just correct in our Bible doctrine and in, in what we believe, you know, so we can pass some type of Bible test or something like that. But let's see to it that we live a life that's, that if God puts that thing through the fire, will there be any real value that comes out? Will there be any real material substance that will survive the, and come out on the other side. That's what I want. I just don't want to take up space for decades and stand before the Lord and have nothing. Amen. So how about, how about you, right? And God, help us. He has to help us not to be reprobates. We ought to live life with a, with a purpose, with a purpose. And my purpose is to have, go through this life that he gave me. And, and at the end, when that fire comes out, just to have something to come out on the other side that was pleasing to God. That, that's what that gold silver, precious stone, that wood, hay, and stubble that you did, those are every man's work shall be declared. Those are the works of the flesh. That thing's going to get burned up, incinerated in an instant. What is this gold that's going to come out that he'll give you? What is this silver, these precious stones? And don't tell, you look forward to a paycheck every single week. Don't tell me you're not going to look forward to God Almighty actually giving you, here's what you've done for me. Here's your reward. And I was thinking, you know, just... just pictures and stuff going up to the new jerusalem up into your city and man you got the angels you got the apostle paul look at there don't tell me you don't we'll talk we'll talk about covetous in a little bit don't tell me you don't covet think people's belongings oh look how nice their yard is look how nice their house is look how nice their truck is look how nice that car is you can get up to the new jerusalem and you'll be man look at that big mansion look at these golden streets look at that look at their golden table golden coffee table and man, and then you're wheeling down the road just your little luggage of you know, a couple trophies that you got, guess, from the Lord, but at least it's something. <laughs> I, I would hate to say, you know, you get the moving day in your mansion and there's nothing there. It's empty. You come to this nice house and there's nothing in it. That'd be kind of odd, wouldn't it? Let's just, uh, let's pray. I want to spend some time in prayer. And, uh, Father, thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Help us, Lord, to take this seriously, Lord, and Help us to take this to heart. This was a very tough message, Lord. Very tough message. I felt you tugging on my heart the whole time, studying it and preparing it and preaching it, Lord. Please, Lord, just may we devote our lives to that which matters, that which is uh, of an eternal substance, that which will survive time and eternity. And, Lord, I hope that I'm not the only one that, that got dealt with during this message. Lord, we don't have an altar up here, but I, I, now would be a good time to have an altar call. And... Um, how about you all here that are here? Why don't you just examine yourself? And I know we're, we're Bible believers and things like that, but are we Bible followers? And are we trying to do our best to obey it? 
Why don't you talk to God for a moment? I don't know if you talk to him all week long. Tell him, you know what to tell him? Tell him you're a hypocrite. And tell him, Lord, I'm sick and tired of being a hypocrite. Tell him that. And uh, I know this book's real. You know the book's real. You see it work in your life. Just talk to God. Tell him, Lord, help me. Help me live this thing out. I need help, Lord. I don't want to be a reprobate. I don't want to, I, I want to do something for you with the time that I got left. And I'm very thankful. I, 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 I get reminded about that passage. Uh, our God, he's a just God. And as long as there's still time on the clock, he'll pay you the same for getting on the job. <laughs> Whether you've been on the job for eight hours, whether you've been on a job for one year, two year, three year, five year, ten year, twenty year, you know, or you just squeaked in, you got you got on a job on the last hour, he's gonna pay you the same. <laughs> the main question is, are you on the job? That's what that's what God's concerned with. And uh, the Bible says I must be about my father's business, so are you? And have you been? If so, keep it up. Lord, just uh cleanse us in your precious blood as we sang about this morning, and help us, Lord, to keep in memory the things that were said this morning. And be vigilant, take heed, pay attention every single day of our life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's stand up. Uh, song, anybody know how to work the speakers? You want to sing a song? It's page number 368. Julia, that, just that power button and that little infinity symbol. Tone, you got, you know how to work them speakers? Plug them, th turn them on. And this song is this pretty this finishes up the message. So listen to the words. <laughs>